Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be doing yet another GPU PCB breakdown, this time the RTX 3080 Strix from uh, Asus. Uh, so I've been sent these pictures of the card by Der Bauer, so big thank you to him for, for those. Um, and yeah, it looks like I'm going to be working through my massive backlog of 30 series cards, because... That's that's just how my brain works. It has now decided that it's very interested in 30 series cards. <laughs> Not that anybody can buy them, but it's like, well, I'm finally... Anyway, um, yeah, so 3080 Strix. Uh, this uses the basically the same power delivery as the 3080 Ti Strix and the 3090 Strix. So everything I say in terms of, like, by that I mean same power stages, same phase counts. Uh, there's a slight difference in terms of the memory filtering configuration, because obviously the uh, the 3090 has far more memory chips, so there's more, more capacitors for dealing with that. And also the 3090 has memory chips where you should have, like, in, you know, sandwiched memory chips, so you can't actually have capacitors in their ideal location, because where you'd want to actually have the caps, there's memory chips. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, this is the best, uh, you know, so this is the best 3080 PCB you can get, um, mostly because there's no Hall of Fame or Kingpin edition for the 3080, whereas for the 3080 Ti there is a Hall of Fame, so the Strix is sort of second place to that, and then for the 3090 there's of course the Hall of Fame and the Kingpin edition, so it's sort of like third place to those um, for, yeah, for, for the 3090s. So let's get into why this uh, PCB is so good. Why, why is it the very best RTX 3080 PCB? So we'll just dive right into the power delivery, right? Um, not much point of talking about anything else in my opinion. So we've got the sort of standard RTX 30 uh, series uh, VRM layout where you've got a one phase of memory power right at the very top. Then you've got a bunch of V-core if I remember correctly. I mean, we can just check the power planes on the back. Oops. Yeah, so one phase memory, then you've got all that V-Core, then you've got your MSVDD, and then another phase of memory. You can you can see the splits in the power plane. Um, anyway, so yeah, you've got memory, then you've got a bunch of V-Core, then you've got MSVDD slash what, what I like to call the Uncore Rail, because that's the closest equivalent it has in, like, at least CPU land. Basically, it's this lower portion of the, the chip. There's a bunch of stuff that isn't the actual cores. It's sort of memory system. It, like, it's caches and memory-ish stuff. And anyway, that's what's powered by MSVDD. Um, then the very last phase, we have another memory phase. And then on the other side of the card, we've got a slightly different arrangement, but sort of, like, standard 30... Again, standard, you know... VRM arrangement for a uh, 3080, but not the same order. So we've got MSVDD at the bottom because, well, like it's powering the lower part of the chip, right? It wouldn't make sense to have it anywhere else. Uh, then we've got one phase of memory power. Um, so that's more VMEM over there. Then we've got more vCore. And then at the very top, we've got more memory power as well as that minor rail above that, which uh, I believe this is 1.8 volts. I am not 100% certain about that, but that's probably 1.8 volts. This is probably the PEX rail. Uh, you don't really need to worry about these un unless you're like trying to repair a GPU. Um, but anyway, so that's the, that's the VRM layout on the card. Uh, we, of course, for the controllers, um, we've got, what is it? All right, well, we've got the best, well, basically the best controller you can get. I, I can't remember if there's a different controller that you can get a 30 series with, so we're just going to go with this as the best, because um, I don't think you can have an XDPE132G5C. Anyway, this is a monolithic power systems MP2888. Uh, controller and uh, that is handling and there's two of them so one of them is handling msvdd the other one is handling vcore for the memory uh power we've got i believe it's this chip let me just check that's back of the card yeah it's that chip isn't it should be
Yeah, because that's a four five four nine one by the looks of things. So yeah, that's yeah, because we also have the connector. Like, isn't Asus so nice to give you the I square C headers for all of their uh, voltage controllers? Uh, unfortunately, I believe these two chips over here actually share the same I square C interface. So if you like try to talk to one, and they might even share the same bus address. So you can't actually talk to them individually. If you try to send a command to one, both of them receive it because they both think they're the same chip. Like they, they both identify as the same chip. So if you send them a command, they, they both, yeah. Or at least I've heard something like that about, about these cards as, as that, that being an issue with them. Or for some reason, these are both configured to, to use the same address, which is like, um, yeah, that's awkward. <laughs> But anyway, this chip over here doesn't have that such an issue because that is a UP9512, and that's just handling the memory VRM. So uh, the phase configurations are, in typical NVIDIA fashion, very awkward. The, the V-Core is a 10 phase, um, which is the maximum that a MP2888 supports. However, there is 12 actual power stages because NVIDIA GPUs. <laughs> Why would we make a VRM that makes any sense? Uh, so yeah, you've got 12, uh, and I'm just going to put power. Actually, these are smart power stages, so we're just going to go for the full smart power stages thing. Um, MSVDD is a six phase, so nothing weird going on there. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's just six power stages. And then we've got the UP9512 running four phases of memory power. So, you know, that's handling that. Um. And there's nothing weird going on with that because, uh, yeah, th actually this is like a reduced pin count version of the 9512. There's a 8 phase 9512 and this is, I believe, a 4 phase 9512. Basically the only difference is that the 8 phase 9512 has a lot of pins on it in order to be able to control all of those phases. And well, if you have a lot of pins, the chip is physically larger. Um, and so Asus opted for the, like, slimmed down UP9512, which internally I think it's exactly the same chip. It's just that they didn't, uh, wire, like, give it all the necessary pins so that they could put it in a smaller, smaller package. Um, anyway, this is, like, totally overkill for memory, like, the, well, not totally overkill for memory control, but there, there's nothing wrong with using a 9512 for the memory. Like, memory power delivery isn't that... Uh, it isn't as difficult to deal with as, say, core power delivery. And, yeah, the 9512 will handle that just fine. Um, and then the MP28... So this is like a partially digital chip. Um, it's limited in terms of the amount of voltage control you... Well, limited in the amount of control you have over that I2C header. Um, I believe you can tweak LLC and there's some limited offset voltage range that you can do. Um, so that's, that's a bit unfortunate. It's not as nice as the MP2880. At the same time, as far as I know, you don't really need a ton of voltage range on 3090s or 3080s or any of these 30 series cards because the, the GDDR6X just doesn't really scale that much with voltage. So the limited offset range doesn't really affect you. And also because it's based on the 9511, you can basically take all of the modifications that work on a 9511. And if you just match the pin out, they also work on the 9512. Um, anyway, then we've got the MP2888s. These are fully digital. They go up to crazy high switching frequencies. Um, literally one of the best controllers you can get on a, on a 3080 or a 3090 or a 3080 Ti. And, uh, very fancy. And I don't actually know, like, these are, are supported by the Elmore Labs EVC2, but I'm not sure, like, what extent of functionality they, they have available. But... I think you should be able to change everything because they are supposed to be like fully digital controllers. So that means LLC control, switching frequency control, up to completely impractical frequencies for for the, these chips. Um, well, for these power stages, I, I've I've not actually like the. I don't know why Monolithic Power Systems has a multi-phase controller that goes up to apparently a 10, 10 megahertz switching frequency, like. I'm not aware of any power stages that, that would support such a high switching frequency, but apparently it can do that. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's a really great controller right there. Should be super fast in terms of dealing with transients and that kind of thing, but unfortunately the only way to confirm if that's actually the case is if you had a card and, you know, hooked up an oscilloscope to it so that you could compare it against other cards. And at that point you also have to factor in like the capacitor configuration and the inductor configuration and 
potentially the programming of the actual voltage controller because just because you're using a high-end voltage controller doesn't mean you can't configure it incorrectly, right? Um, but uh, yeah, like the hardware, hardware-wise here, like this, this is as as far as controller choices go, this is as good as it basically gets for 30 series uh, cards. Now then, let's talk about the actual power, and then the weird phase count thing, like, th this controller has been used for, for these weird phase count NVIDIA GPUs in the past, so that's, that's nothing new. Anyway, let's talk about the actual smart power stages, so, and let's not put that over the power connectors, I might want to write on there for some reason. Uh, these are Texas Instruments, um, CSD, uh, 954, Wait, am I right? 95481, yes. Uh, RWJs. Um, and these are 60 amp smart power stages, so not the highest rated uh, smart power stages out there. And also there's no public data sheet. At least there wasn't one at the time that I wrote my notes for this. And my notes are very old. I think I wrote them several months ago. Um, yay me, seriously, <laughs> I'm incredible. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, so 60 amp smart power stage, and I'm going for the efficiency figures off of the CSD uh, 95372BQ uh, BQ5M, because I believe that was like a 60 amp smart power stage that I could get a data sheet for, whereas I can't for the for the 95481s. So, um, I don't know, like put this in brackets. Where there? We'll pretend it's a, uh, pretend it's one of these. Um, anyway, these being smart power stages just means they have integrated current monitoring, which is supposed to be more accurate than some, like, what you'd get on some, uh, well, other current monitoring methods that existed in the past. Uh, they have built-in temperature monitoring, a uh, bunch of safety features like over-temperature protection, over-current protection, short-circuit protection. Uh, so yeah, these these are pretty awesome. In fact, I've heard of smart power, st like, smart power stage, well, I've heard of GPUs using smart power stages where a smart power stage would actually straight up die. And thanks to the short-circuit protection, the card, you, you could keep running the card. Like, with the dead power stage still in place, you could keep running the card because the short circuit protection would basically uh, just stop the power stage from, from being active um, without causing any further damage to the card. So that's, that's a neat feature. You shouldn't rely on it. Like, the short circuit protect... Like, there, I've also heard of cards where, you know, the short circuit protection... Like, it, the power stage fails and the short circuit protection doesn't actually manage to do anything. But, uh, yeah, um, you know, smart power stages are pretty cool. Uh, thanks to all the safety features and all the monitoring they have built in, and also they are very, very efficient. Um, so in terms of vCore power delivery, um, we're going to be, and again, we have the, you know, the split VR, like the reason why we have the side, like VRM on both sides of the chip is because it effectively gives you a wider power plane cross section. So you get less power lo loss in the, in the power plane. Um, and anyway, let's talk about the actual VRM efficiency, which doesn't actually, like, so the figure, the efficiency figures I'm going through do not account for power plane power loss because I have no idea, no, no way of knowing the resistance of the power plane. Um, also, it would be incredibly difficult to measure because it's like this power stage is going to have a slightly different resistance to the core compared to this power stage or this power stage, right? So, yeah, I'm actually, I'd... I wonder if there's like I I'd love to know if there's actually like a good way of of getting like a power plane resistance measurement. Maybe maybe it's just a sort of like well build it and see if it overheats. <laughs> it seems like a terrible probably probably some kind of simulation can can handle that. Um, yeah, I don't know how you'd measure that. That that seems way too difficult. Anyway, um, so efficiency. We're assuming an output voltage of 1.2 volts, which is kind of high for, for 3090s. It's also higher than what you'd see. Like, there's a lot of 30... Well, 3080s, 3090s, it, I consider them the same thing. A lot of the other 30 series, like, high-end uh, 30 series cards that I've covered uh, use power stages where the power efficiency figures are all done at 1 volt. Uh, generally speaking, your heat output goes up as your output voltage goes up, so heat output at 1.2 volts, like achieving, like let's say you had a power stage that at one volt produced two watts of heat for 20 watts of uh, current output. Well, at 1.2 volts, it would probably produce like 
one watts of heat or well actually that's kind of high no actually 2.1 watts of heat sounds cur is that yeah that's about five percent right yeah that's five percent yeah so that that would be about right so you know um so basically what i'm getting at is because these ratings are at 1.2 volts and not one volt uh, this is actually more efficient than, like, the, the watts here are sort of more significant than watts on a 1-volt one, one rated, uh, efficient, like, a 1-volt, a, a chip that has its efficiency rating in 1-volt, which, yeah, it, it's annoying that, the you know, it makes comparisons kind of awkward because it's like, oh, at 1.2 one volts efficiency figures are, uh, gonna be, well, the efficiency actually goes up, but the, also the heat output goes up, right? So that, that's kind of the thing. It's, yeah, it makes comparisons a bit awkward, but basically we, we don't have to worry about this too much here with this card because the combination of extremely efficient 60 amp smart power stages and the very high number of them means that across basically the entire current range, this thing delivers like great efficiency um, for, for, the, for the VRM. So 200 amps output, you're looking at only 14 watts of heat. And well, that's just like, that's just great. Like, if, if that was at 1 volt, it would be great. At 1.2 volts, it's even better. Um, at 300 amps output, this VRM should produce about 25 watts of heat, and we're talking about the same thing. Like, straight up, this is, uh, in, in this current range, that's about as efficient as you can really be. Because um, if you start adding even more power stages, generally, you're actually going to get worse efficiency at around 200 amps, going past the 12 power stage point. Uh, and then... 300 amps, I think you can actually still slightly improve the efficiency with like one or two more power stages, but this is right around the peak of the efficiency curve for, for most smart power stages. So yeah, uh, you don't, well, for these power stages in this configuration, and these are very, very efficient, so there's not really much room for improvement whatsoever. Um, anyway, 400 amps output. Um, now we're getting into like LN2 overclocking territory, 42 watts of heat. Um, so this, of course, is like, very ma actually this might be possible on ambient i don't know i don't know how much power each part of the card pulls unfortunately um but yeah so 400 amps output 42 watts of heat this is still very manageable depending on the vrm cooling system and you know this is a gpu like gpus have a very significant uh vrm cooling advantage over motherboards in that uh there's fans just attached to the gpu pointed directly at the pcv so generally speaking, um, GPUs can get away with higher VRM heat outputs than motherboards by comparison because motherboards from a cooling perspective are really suboptimal um, compared to what like GPUs are doing where you like, especially like a card like this where you have a heatsink that just attaches directly to the VRM and then that heatsink just directly gets airflow from a fan. Um, and then they have that on both sides of the card. Um, Anyway, 400 amps output, so 42 watts of heat. 500 amps output, it'll produce about 60 watts of heat. And 600 amps output, it'll produce about 88 watts of heat. And, you know, uh, this card, well, this PCB was actually used by OGS to get some really top scores uh, with the RTX 3090 in Port Royal before they switched over to using a Hall of Fame card. So that, like... Th this really is as good as it gets without having, you know, a Hall of Fame or a Kingpin Edition, uh, Kingpin Edition PCB. And, uh, yeah, like, this is very much, like, for, for LN2 overclock, like, this will do LN2 overclocking, this will do everything. Um, you can get more, like, you can get cards with more powerful power delivery, but there's, like, two of them. <laughs> so, th this card really, like, of what I would consider normal consumer cards, and the Strix series, the Strix cards are generally kind of pushing that definition of normal consumer cards, it doesn't really get better than this. And also, like, you can't have a Hall of Fame 3080 or a, or a Kingpin Edition 3080, so for, for 3080s, like, if you're gonna, if you wanted to take a 3080 on LN2, you get this. There's no other options as far as I'm concerned. Um, or at least I've not seen any, like, I'm not aware of any other com cards that would be comparable to this. So, yeah, in my opinion, get this for, for LN2 overclocking. It, it doesn't get better with 3080s. Um, so let's talk about the MSVDD rail. And the MSVDD is the same situation because it uses yet more 
uh, of these lovely uh, 60 amp smart power stages from Texas Instruments. So at 1.2 volts output voltage, we're again, we're using the same operating rate, like operating conditions because I'm using the same data sheet and no, it don't, didn't have voltage scaling curve or frequency curve. Actually, I think it had a few, might have had a, might have had like a one megahertz efficiency curve, which is like nobody, you shouldn't run your VRM at a megahertz. Like that's, that's a great way to make it really hot, really quickly. Um, oh, with a card like a 3080, you might actually get a bit of volt, like a, maybe get a significant voltage regulation improvement that might be worth it. But yeah, like you wouldn't want to do that for long-term use. For benchmarks, you might be able to get away with it. Anyway, so 100 amps output on the MSVDD rail, we're going to be taking a look at, uh, we're, it should produce about seven watts of heat. Uh, 150 amps output, it should produce about 13 watts of heat. Uh, 200 amps output, about 21 watts of heat. And uh, 300 amps output, about 44 watts of heat. So, yeah, like, again, you could totally take this on LN2. Um, and that's the, like, people have taken this PCB on LN2 and had great success with it. So there's no surprise, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, well, this this is why this works so well. Um, so that's the MSVDD rail. And then for the memory rail, we actually have different power stages, um, which are, uh, NCP, no, that's an M, NCP 30, 20, nope, 31, uh, 51s. So these are 50 amp smart power stages from on semiconductor. You can tell it's from on semiconductor because of the NCP part number. Uh, and yeah, these are one of those power stages that are rated at one volt. And I didn't, uh, evidently I didn't decide to scale up to, to 1.35 volts. So actually, I, why am I drawing? Technically speaking, the memory controller on uh, on an NVIDIA GPU does get, you know, memory voltage applied to it. So technically some of the power from here does go there, but usually we think of it as going to the memory chips. So uh, to the memory chip. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, so memory outputting, uh, so this is going to be 1 volt and 500 kilohertz switching frequency. Uh, 40 amps output, it'll produce about 4 watts of heat, um, which is, that, that's around what the memory should be pulling most, well, that's like stock memory power draw should be somewhere around 40 amps. Uh, and then 80 amps output, it'll be producing about uh, 8 watts of heat which is, you know, very manageable amount of heat output for the memory VRM. And also the memory should never pull more than 80 amps. Like, well, no, it really shouldn't be pulling more than 80 amps. That's that's honestly an insane amount of current for like a memory system. Um, anyway, and then we have a hundred, well, but if for some reason, like if for some reason it did, 120 amps, the VRM would produce about 14 watts of heat, which is still... Uh, well, that's actually for like a four phase, that's, that's a lot of heat, um, just in terms of how much heat each of the power stages is producing, but should still be very manageable. Also, there's like, I, there's no way you're getting the memory to pull 120 amps. I refuse to believe that the GD, like it, cause, cause if the thing is all the information I have available for, about GDDR6 memory chips indicates that they should pull somewhere between 40, like the, the, the memory configurations on the 3080, the 3080 Ti and the 3090, none of them should pull more than like 60 watts of power. And that's at 1.35 volts. So that should be, you know, there's not going to be even 60 amps at 1.35 volts. Um, but anyway, so yeah, memory VRM is not as re like, well, I, I don't know that I would consider this insane overkill. Well, for ambient, insane overkill. For LN2, adequate amounts of overkill. <laughs> or more like not actually overkill at all. It's just kind of like, yeah, this this is what you need. Um, cause 30, 90, 3080s, 3080ti's, 3090s on LN2 pull absolutely stupid amounts of power. Um, and so, yeah, you, you do need a VRM that, you know, is 12 smart power stages, it's 12 60 amp smart power stages for vCore, and then another six smart power stages for MSVDD, and then, you know, four more smart power stages for the memory rail, because, but the memory actually kind of pulls the same amount of power regardless of operating conditions, cause... The, the memory doesn't go faster when you're on LN2. In fact, a real problem with these 30 series cards is that the memory doesn't like being too cold. And so when it gets cold, it slows down. Um, so yeah, if anything, this probably has to work less when the card is cold. But 
Anyway, so that is the power delivery and current handling capacity of, of the RTX 3080 Strix. And for 3080s, it doesn't get better. For 3080 Ti's, there is the Hall of Fame Edition. And for 3090s, you have the Hall of Fame Edition and the Kingpin Edition. So those are the only two cards that really, you know, are an upgrade above, like, yeah, are an upgrade to this. So... Anyway, let's talk about what Asus has done with the output filtering and the input filtering. And let's start with the input filtering because it's nice and simple. So on this side, we've got, you know, just through... We've got... Uh, <laughs> I hate these so much. It's like, so the thing is, I like to call these SMD aluminum polymers. These are technically aluminum polymers. And, norm and they have legs. They have legs, but they're not through hole because these are SMD... Uh, also technically SMD aluminum polymers. The thing is, the way these are structured is you basically take your regular, uh, you know, you, you take your regular can capacitor like that, and it's got its legs, right? Um, and normally those legs go through a hole in the PCB and then it gets soldered to the PCB. But these have this fancy plastic adapter plate at the bottom. So instead of the legs going down like that, the legs go like this. And now it's an SMT capacitor. Isn't that amazing? Um, yeah, the only issue is, like, these are still, like, the, the, the thing is, the, the low, the high ESL of these is down to the fact that they have legs. It's not down to the fact how they're attached to the PCB. Because, honestly, you could put actual, like, you can put extension wires onto, like, these SP caps, and they still outperform, uh, cylindrical capacitors like that. So it's just, like, down to the way these are internally structured that makes them, uh, inferior to SP caps and other sort of, and, and like pause caps and, and other molded capacitors. Yeah, that's, that I think, like, the black rectangle's good. Uh, <laughs> but basically, this style of capacitor packaging has just less ESL to it, and it's down to how they're internally structured. It's not so much down to the actual legs. Because you, you could, like, you could give these legs, and they're still going to outperform these. Um, and I know that because that, like, that is actually a regular way I use these SP caps is, like, if you're modding a card, um, you know, if you don't have any unpopulated pads available to, to attach them to, the easiest way to attach these to a card is you just put legs on these. And these with legs on them work much better than through-hole capacitors, um, in my experience, so... Yeah, it's, it's down to the, the way these are internally uh, built. But anyway, on the input filtering, that doesn't really matter so much because the uh, input filtering doesn't have to deal with as fast transients as the output filtering has to deal with, um, just because the transients come from the core and so the transients get slowed down going through the uh, inductors, uh, you know, to the power stages and then, then finally you get the bulk capacitors and also we've got like these multi-layer ceramics to, to deal with the really fast stuff. Um, well, just like these are mostly there to deal with the actual like switch on and off of the of the power stage. Um, yeah, so we've got a bunch of uh, SM can, S can capacitors for the input filtering on this side of the VRM, and those are 270 microfarads each. And there's basically one per power stage, I think, uh, which is what you normally see on a 30 series card. So nothing to complain about over there. Uh, on this side, we have 560 microfarad SP caps um, for input filtering. And fun fact, these are discontinued now. So I don't know what ASUS is using for these because I, I guess for the the newer, like, or at least I, I don't know, maybe ASUS still has a stockpile of these, but when I was looking through uh, capacitors for input filtering modding on my 6900 XTs, these were discontinued. Like, Panasonic's website was like, don't use these for new designs. And I was like, oh, so they're going to be awkward to get. Um, anyway, so, yeah, and we just have the ones on the front. So, uh, yeah, we have basically a 506, uh, I mean, 56 microfarad uh, SP cap for, and these are going to be 16 volts uh, rated. So, yeah, you have a uh, five, 56 microfarad uh, 16 volt SP cap for every single power stage. And what's in, like, you'll notice that there's, like, a significant difference in the capacitance between these. And I believe that's just down to the fact that these have that much, like, much lower ESL. And ESR-wise, they're actually not going to have an advantage. Or they really, sh yeah, they, they probably don't have much of an advantage. They should be about the same ESR. But the ESL on these is much lower. That's why I assume, you know, Asus is okay with just having 56 microfarads per power stage on this side of the VRM. Whereas here they have 270. Um... 
But uh, yeah, so that's that's the input filtering, and honestly, pretty standard. You know, thirty eighty, thirty ninety uh, setup. Like n nothing wrong with it, um, but it's also not not anything special. Like I'm pretty sure the Kingpin Edition is all as like all pause caps on the input filter and. That actually gives you, you know, the advantages of the lower ESL and the uh, lower... Well, actually, you can get pause caps in really high capacitance in, in 16 volts. That's like the one place tantalum capacitors make a lot of sense, because you can get 100 microfarad... Like, because the, the high voltage SP caps, you just can't get them in really high capacitances. 56 mi microfarads is, I think, about as high as it gets for 16 volt rated SP caps. But for pulse caps, you can get like 100 microfarads or 200 microfarads, uh, depending on how much you're willing to, like, you, you can get some really high capacitance in that 16 volt rating. Um, so, yeah, but nothing wrong with this as far as I'm concerned. Um, just kind of standard 30, 30, 80, 30, 90 things. But the output filtering, um, I'm a big fan. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of the output filtering all, uh, on this card. So, uh, behind the core, we have only MLCCs, but you will notice that we have a bunch of unpopulated capacitor pads just all over the place. And this is very normal. Uh, the vast majority of cards will actually not populate these. Uh, there are some exceptions to this, like Gigabyte uh, populates them on, on their cards, or at least some of their cards. Uh, the recent Zotac card that we looked at also populates those. Um, but at the same time, you know, like Asus has decided to go for the multilayer ceramics for all of the, like, like all of these multi-layer ceramics instead of using any SP caps or pause caps behind the core. Not that I've actually seen a 3080, 3080 Ti or 3090 using pause caps behind the core, because um, pause caps generally have worse ESR than SP caps, and also just worse ESL than SP caps, so that's probably why they don't get put right behind the bloody core where you need really, really fast capacitors, but um, yeah, anyway... Um, Asus here has opted for just multilayer ceramics, and then they haven't, like, you know, they, they use sort of the standard population of multilayer ceramics within what you normally see on a on a 30, high-end 30 series card. So uh, you'd have to consult an oscilloscope to know how much, like, if how much better this is, but on paper, this is good. So I like that. Uh, and then the output filter, I mean, I love the output filter on this card. <laughs> it's great, because Asus has just gone and... Every single capacitor here is a 470 microfarad. And what's also neat is these are... So these are 2 volt. Um, actually, so that's that's standard GPU things. Because the thing is, these the output voltage that you're pushing into the core is really low. So no reason to use a higher voltage rated capacitor. But these are all 470 microfarad uh, Panasonic SP caps. Or at least as far as I can tell, these are Panasonic SP caps. Um, and this is about as good as it gets. Like, these have the lowest ESRs, the lowest ESLs. Now, these are just the two-terminal version, um, right? You, you can see that there's only this pad and this pad. Uh, Panasonic also makes a three-terminal version, which has even less ESL, but those are really freaking expensive, so I can totally understand why Asus isn't bothering with those. Um, and yeah, and Asus is just using them for memory uh, and core and everything. Like, the entire output filter here is just SP caps and... Like, it doesn't get better than that. Um, well, actually, no. There are cards that do it better. You have, say, the Kingpin Edition uses a... I think that one's on pulse caps for the out, main output filter, but that uses, like, a mix of pulse caps and then extra multilayer ceramics. So you have, of course, the multilayer ceramics behind the core, but then you also can have multilayer ceramics, right? Direct, like, coming right off of the VRM. Uh, which, you know, this, this card isn't really meant to compete with a Kingpin Edition or a Hall of Fame. Um, and so a Asus went with a somewhat simpler design, but it's still like these, you're not getting better bulk capacitors than this, uh, right? Like the, the next step up in terms of, uh, like the next upgrade in terms of ESR and ESL is like you go with multi-layer ceramics. And if you need a certain amount of capacitance, you're not going to be getting it with multi-layer ceramics because they are way too expensive per microfarad. Um, so... Yeah, and then there's the Hall of Fame, which is just, like, just watch the video about the Hall of Fame PCB. Like, Galax just does not understand <laughs> such a thing as too many capacitors. They don't believe in that. Um, so, yeah, but out of the, like, out of 3080 PCBs, you're not going to get anything better than this. So, yeah, that is the... 
So that's the output filtering. Basically, we have the best possible capacitors used everywhere. I, you know, I mean, I would have preferred it if they populated all of the ones before behind the core. But at the same time, basically, no, like very few manufacturers actually bother with those, so I don't find that really that surprising. Um, and yeah, so that's that's the uh, output filtering on the card. And then, of course, this is a 3080, so we've got a bunch of shunt resistors, because why, why would you only monitor the power going through your power connectors when you can monitor the... Like, why make your power delivery simple if you can make your power delivery very, very complicated? Um, thank you, NVIDIA. Very cool. Anyway, then we've got... Uh, so the shunts are all monitored by this chip over here, which that is an NCP45491. And then we've got on the back of the card another NCP45491 over here. Or at least I'm pretty sure that's another NCP45491. And those are four channel shunt monitoring chips. So each of them can monitor four shunts. And I'm pretty sure there's eight of them on this card in total. Um, yeah. Other than that, Asus also gives the has a BIOS switch on the card. So, you know, if you want to mess around with flashing like extreme overclocking BIOSes onto, the, onto it, you can. Uh, with relatively risk-free, thanks to the BIOS switch. And uh, yeah, that's it. You know, I'm starting to realize that I am not noticing a bunch of unnecessary transistors on the 12 volt side of the card. So I guess Asus ditched that. Because the thing is, a lot of NVIDIA GPUs will have a bunch of like little transistors scattered around the PCB for sh like moving power between fate, like for basically redistributing power from the power connectors to the VRM in order to like better manage the power limits. Um, and that's literally it. It's not to improve power delivery or anything. It's just to stop the, the power management from freaking out. Um, again, NVIDIA's like, how, like how NVIDIA has implemented its power limits is just like, you could have just built in some kind of hysteresis into it where it allows overdraw for some amount of time. But instead, NVIDIA is like, no, no, no. No, uh, we're going to change which connector is connected to which face on the fly, because that's that's way better. Anyway, this card isn't doing any of that, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, so, yeah, that is the uh, RTX 3080 Strix from, from Asus. And uh, as I've mentioned multiple times at this point, literally the best RTX 3080 PCB you can get. Um, or at least as far as I'm aware. I've not seen any RTX 3080 PCB that I was like, whoa, this this is better than a Strix. I've seen a lot of them where it was like, oh, this is almost as good as the Strix, but nothing better. Um, and then for 3080 Ti's, the only competition this has is the Hall of Fame, and then 3090 Hall of Fame Kingpin Edition are, are upgrades. Um, so, yeah, that is the uh, RTX 3080... Strix PCB. Um, thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe. Leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comment section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There is a link to that down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, you know, the usual YouTuber merch. And uh, it would be much appreciated if you check out the Patreon and Teespring links because they help out immensely with running the channel. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it for the video. So thank you for watching and goodbye.